Welcome back from the break. We hope you had time to refresh your coffee to prepare you for our next presentation. First, we'll present on Gadufa 3 labeling updates and tips. This presentation will highlight Gadufa 3 updates that impact ANDA labeling and provide tips on ANDA labeling submissions. Our first presenter, Commander Julie Nishiwa, is a supervisor in Division of Labeling Review in the Office of Regulatory Operations within OGD. Our next presenter in this session is Dr. Kimi Odesina, who's a senior labeling reviewer in the Division of Labeling Review in ORO and OGD. She joined CEDAR in 2014. Our final presenter in this in this session, in this presentation, will be Lieutenant Commander Cody Ochiozo, who serves as a labor reviewer in OGD. She plays a critical role in advancing FDA's public health mission by mitigating errors on medication labeling to promote the safe and effective use of generic drugs. Our next presentation is an overview of major quality deficiencies and approaches available in GADOO for 3. Our presenter, Carolyn, Karen Ireland serves as a regulatory, senior regulatory business process manager in OPQ's Office of Programs and Regulatory Operations. She's been in the FDA with OPRO since 2017. She has expertise in supporting the quality review of pre-market NDAs and has represented OPRO in working groups for guidance and changes in the GADUFA 3 program. Our final presentation before the Q&A panel is on drug product quality tips, drug device combination products. Our presenter, Dr. Kwai Kwok, is a senior pharmaceutical quality assessor in the division of liquid-based drug products. In this role, he acts as the application technical lead for integrated quality assessment of generic, parenteral, ophthalmic, topical, oral, and inhalation solution drug products. For the past seven years, he's been reviewing ANDA, bio-IND, and pre-ANDA meeting packages involving complex drug products. Also, he served as an FDA liaison to the USP Packaging and Distribution Expert Committee for developing USP packaging chapters and standards as a member and as a member for the development of FDA guidance for drug delivery performance of drug device combination products. Now, please join me in welcoming our first presenter, Commander Nishiwa. Welcome everyone. I am Commander Nashwat and I am excited to start the presentation on Kadufa 3 labeling updates and tips. The objectives of this presentation are to discuss generic drug user fee amendments or Kadufa 3 updates that impact abbreviated new drug application or ANDA labeling. We will also discuss best practices for ANDA labeling submissions, including best practices specific to ANDA supplements. GADUFA was signed into law on July 9, 2012. GADUFA agreements are negotiated by FDA and representatives of the generic drug industry to address regulatory challenges. GADUFA is authorized every five years, with the most recent reauthorization being for fiscal years 2023 to 2027, also known as GADUFA 3. Labeling is an important component of CADUFA 3 and the generic drug program. The Division of Labeling Review, or DLR within the Office of Generic Drugs, ensures that the generic drug labeling is the same as the approved labeling for the product's reference listed drug, or RLD, except for differences allowed under Section 505J2A5 of the Act and 21 CFR 314.94A84. DLR also ensures that the labels and labeling accurately reflect the drug product information and provide sufficient information for safe and effective use of the drug product. DLR has several commitments under CADUFA 3. In the first assessment cycle and after receiving an ANDA for assessment, DLR will determine 
whether a consult needs to be issued to another review discipline and then initiate such consults. DLR will strive to issue the labeling re discipline review letter or DRL at months six to seven for ANDAs with a 10 month goal date and at months five to six for ANDAs with an eight month goal date. DLR will limit the labeling assessment to one information request or IR or one DRL if other disciplines will not be acceptable during the first cycle. DLR will continue to assess labeling to enable an action within the assessment cycle if other disciplines are acceptable. Issuance of complete response letters that contain only labeling deficiencies will be minimized by utilizing later cycle IRs and DRLs, as well as the imminent action process. Now we'll go over best practices as it relates to QD for three timelines and labeling. As mentioned previously, one commitment under QD for three is to determine whether a consult needs to be issued to another review discipline and to initiate such consults. An example of a potential situation that could lead to a consult includes labeling where the applicant has proposed to carve out information protected by patents and or exclusivities. To help facilitate identifying possible consults and addressing these carve out issues earlier in the assessment cycle, we request that applicants prominently identify, e.g. use bold font to indicate labeling carve outs in cover letters. Other tips include addressing all patents and or exclusivities listed for the RLD and also ensuring the proposed labeling carve out is consistent with patent certifications and exclusivity statements. We also recommend monitoring available labeling resources and making necessary revisions to labeling. Drugs at FDA is the official source for approved labeling. So we recommend checking drugs at FDA routinely and prior to submitting labeling amendments to ensure that your proposed labeling is the same as the last approved labeling for the RLD except for differences outlined in Section 505J of the Act and the CFR. We recommend monitoring the Orange Book for any updates to the RLD's patents and exclusivities. As soon as you identify updates to the RLD's patents and exclusivities, we recommend being proactive in addressing the new patents and exclusivities and submitting labeling that is consistent with the new patents, patent certifications and exclusivity statements as applicable. We also recommend checking the United States Pharmacopeia National Formulary for updates to drug product monographs and USP general chapters. In any of these cases where applicable information is posted on drugs at FDA, Orange Book, or USPNF, we encourage applicants to go ahead and submit labeling as appropriate to address the updated information in these resources. Please do not wait to receive a DRL to address these issues. Be proactive and identify and address these updates as soon as possible to allow timely review of your labeling. Now we have our first challenge question. Which resource should be used to find the RLD's last approved labeling? Is it A, Daily Med, B, Orange Book, C, Drugs at FDA, or D, USPNF? I will give you a few seconds to think about the correct answer. For those that pick C, Drugs at FDA, you are correct. I want to emphasize that Drugs at FDA is the official source for approved labeling, so please use Drugs at FDA when finding the RLD's last approved labeling. I did also want to note that while Daily Med does post labeling on their website, it may not always be the last approved labeling, and therefore, Drugs at FDA should be the primary resource for finding the RLD's last approved labeling. Now, I will hand it over to Lieutenant Commander Echozo for the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Commander Nashwat, for the introduction. During this portion of the presentation, I'll be sharing best practices for ANDA labeling submissions. If you're looking for golden nuggets, I'd encourage you to continue to stay tuned in. As a quick highlight, over the next few slides, I'll discuss the importance of ensuring consistent labeling submissions correct editorial and grammatical statements, proper formatting of the limitation statement and title, 
the importance of submitting consistent drug product name and manufacturing statements, adequately differentiating related products and or product strengths, the recommended format for expiration dates, ensuring the appropriate use of labeling statements, confirming a sufficient number of medication guides are provided, compliance with standards for feral and cap overseal for injectable products, child-resistant packaging, CRP, verification statements, and lastly, submitting consistent CRP statements. So we have a lot to cover, so let's dive in. Have you seen anyone walking around with two different colored socks? Perhaps if your answer is yes, your mind had probably guessed that the person was most likely in a rush or made an honest mistake. In a similar vein, inconsistent labeling submissions is an error that can easily be avoided. When submitting the Microsoft Word and PDF text versions of your labeling, it's important to ensure that the information is the same and consistent in your submissions. Additionally, the submitted document should align with the latest RLD labeling found at Drugs at FDA. We strongly advise that you conduct a thorough review of your submitted labeling pieces for spelling, spacing, typographical, grammatical, and or data errors. Editorial and grammatical errors in labeling may be misinterpreted by the end user and can lead to medication errors that ultimately result in patient harm. So this is something we do take seriously. For example, trailing zeros or missing zeros can lead to a dosing error. Examples of other errors are shown on the slide. For prescribing information labeling following the physician labeling rule format, in the highlights section of the labeling, ensure that the limitation statement and title are formatted correctly. As shown on the slide, we recommend that the name of the drug product be presented in uppercase letters to improve its prominence. One of the concepts we would like to drive in today is the importance of consistency. Throughout the PI, the references to the drug substance and drug product should be consistent. For example, if your drug product name is ABC Tablets, do not simply reference the drug product in some places as ABC, while in other places as ABC tablets. Use the established name, including the dosage form, when referencing the drug product. So in our example, references to the drug product should be consistently presented as ABC tablets. When naming the place of business of a manufacturer, packager, or distributor, include one of the qualifying statements found in the CFR listed on the slide. And make sure this information is consistent across all labeling pieces where it's listed and or required. In July of 2006, the Institute of Medicine published a report titled Preventing Medication Errors. The report cited labeling and packaging issues as the cause of 33% of medication errors, and an astounding 30% of fatalities from medication errors. It emphasized that the product naming, labeling, and packaging should be designed for the end user, that is, the provider in the clinical environment and or the consumer. One of the ways to create safer labels is to adequately distinguish and differentiate different strengths of the drug product and or proposed product labels from your other related products. This can be achieved through boxing, contrasting colors, and or some other means as demonstrated on the slide. Although there are various ways to write an expiration date, we have found that the use of two letter months and two digit year abbreviations for expiration dates has led to confusion misinterpretation, and sometimes delay in treatment because the abbreviation was interpreted incorrectly. For example, the abbreviation MA could mean the month of March or May, whereas the number 12 could represent the day, month, or year. Therefore, we recommend using a four-digit year. 
Also include a hyphen or forward slash to separate the portions of the expiration date. The alphabetical character abbreviations shown on the slide are the preferred format for the months as well as the expression of the expiration date. When warning or cautionary statements are needed for the drug product, it is pertinent that the correct labeling statement is utilized. Non-affirmative warning or cautionary statements have been misinterpreted. Therefore, affirmative statements should be used. For example, for intravenous use only, fatal if given by any other route, or must dilute before use. These are examples of statements that are more easily understood. Let's go through the examples shown on the slide. For injectable single dose products, include the discard statement on the container label and other labeling as appropriate and as space permits. For example, include the statement discard unused portion. For injectable pharmacy bulk packages, add a prominent box declaration on the principal display panel reading pharmacy bulk package not for direct infusion. For products without gluten, the term gluten-free is not acceptable. Instead, we recommend the following statement, contains no ingredient made from a gluten-containing grain, wheat, barley, or rye. The warning statement for rubber, latex-free is not acceptable. We recommend the statement, this specify the component you're referencing is not made with natural rubber latex. The CFR uses the term natural rubber to include natural rubber latex, dry natural rubber, and synthetic latex or synthetic rubber that contains natural rubber in its formulation. When any of these are included in the product, add the caution statement Caution, this product contains natural rubber latex, which may cause allergic reactions. Lastly, there are special labeling statements and regulatory requirements needed for certain inactive ingredients. Specifically, tartrazine, aspartame, and sulfite are a few. Although this is not an exhaustive list, we wanted to point out some examples please reference the CFR listed on the slide for additional information. Thank you for your undivided attention thus far. I'd like to turn the floor back over to Commander Neshwat to wrap up the remaining content for this section. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Ochozo. I will continue with presenting on best practices for ANDA labeling submissions. Another topic we want to highlight is confirming a sufficient number of medication guides when applicable. We want to ensure that a sufficient number of medication guides are available for dispensing and distribution of your drug product per 21 CFR 208.24b. We request that applicants provide a statement that a sufficient number of medication guides are available for dispensing and distribution for your drug product in Module 1.14.1 and or the question-based review, or QBR. If this information is not provided in the submission, a comment will be issued asking the applicant to confirm this information. Another area we are going to discuss is complying with standards of ferals and cap overseals for injectable products. We request that applicants provide a comment in Module 3.2.P.7, Container Closure System, as to whether text appears on your product's cap and feral overseal, and to also comment on the color of your product's cap. This is very important to include in your submission as we want to ensure that your proposed cap and feral overseal are in compliance with the requirements of the USP General Chapter 7 labeling for ferals and cap overseals. Per USP standards, a cautionary statement is intended to prevent an imminent life-threatening situation and may include instructional statements that provide potency or other safety-related instructions if warranted. If no cautionary statement is necessary, the feral and cap overseal 
must remain blank. Again, we request commenting in module 3.2.p.7 as to whether text appears on your cap in Feral Overseal and also to comment on the color of your cap as only potassium chloride for injection concentrate can have a black cap. For USP standards, only cautionary statements may appear on the top or circle surface of the ferrule and cap overseal. If a cautionary statement is necessary for your drug product, we recommend providing a high resolution image of your ferrule and cap overseal in module 3.2.p.7 container closure system and ensure there is adequate contrast between the proposed text and color of the ferrule and cap overseal as we want to ensure the cautionary statement is easily read. Now we'll move on to child resistant packaging or CRP verification statements. Ensure that your proposed packaging meets the requirements of the Poison Prevention Packaging Act or PPPA. We encourage including a written verification statement in Module 3.2.P.7 that your product's packaging meets the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's or CPSC's child resistant packaging standards. An example of a written verification statement may be, we verify in the submission that the following package or packages meet U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's CPSC's standards under 16 CFR 1700. If you choose to include CRP statements in your labeling to indicate that your product packaging is child resistant, please ensure they are consistent across all labeling pieces. If including CRP information in the PI, the patient labeling, it should appear in the how supplied storage and handling section of the PI and the how should I store drug X section of the patient labeling. Again, the CRP statements in the PI and patient labeling should be consistent. If choosing to include CRP statements on prescription drug container labels and carton labeling, display the CRP statement on the side panel in close proximity to the storage information. For a non-prescription or OTC product, display the CRP statement in the drug facts labeling under the subheading Other Information. We refer you to the Child Resistant Packaging Statements and Drug Product Labeling Guidance for Industry for additional details. Now we have our second challenge question. Which of the following statements is true? A, cautionary statements may appear on the side surface of the ferrule and cap overseal. B, consistent Microsoft Word document and PDF text version should be submitted for PI and patient labeling pieces. C, gluten-free is an acceptable labeling statement or D, different strengths of the proposed drug product should not be adequately differentiated, e.g. boxing, contrasting colors, and or some other means. Please take a few seconds to think about which statement is true. For those that selected B, you are correct. Consistent Microsoft Word document and PDF text version should be submitted for the PI and patient labeling pieces. The other three statements are false. Now I will hand over the next part of the presentation over to Dr. Odeshina. Thank you, Commander Neshawa. In this portion of the presentation, we will be discussing best practices for ANDA labeling supplements. We will discuss the importance of having a detailed cover letter ensuring a complete submission, patents and exclusivities, side-by-side -side comparisons, electronic patient labeling, URLs, and lastly, PADA safety labeling changes. Detailed cover letter. Clearly and accurately state the proposed changes in the cover letter. Failure to do so may lead to a CBE being denied to a PAS at a later date. For CBE zero RLT updates, state the NDA number, supplement number, and the date of approval of the reference supplement in the format shown on the slide. Ensure complete submission. 
Note that DLR does not issue acknowledgement letters for CBE zeros. If we request for an amendment to a specific supplement, please do not submit a new supplement. Submit an amendment to the referenced supplement. For ANDAs with shared prescribing information, provide submissions for each ANDA. For example, if ANDA A and B share an insert, if a CBE0 is submitted to ANDA A for labeling updates to be in accordance with the reference listed drug, the applicant should submit a CBE0 for ANDA B as well. Patents and exclusivities. Ensure that the proposed labeling is consistent with patent certification and exclusivity statements. For labeling carve-outs to align with an agency-issued BPCA template, also address the new exclusivities listed in the Orange Book. New labeling carve-outs due to exclusivities should be submitted as a prior approval supplement, not as a CBE. Submissions to align with an agency-issued BPCA template should be submitted as a CBE. Side-by-side -side comparisons. Provide a side-by-side -side comparison of either the approved RLD labeling with the proposed ANDA labeling or the previously approved ANDA labeling with the currently proposed ANDA labeling. For amendments, Note and submit what was requested in the issued letter. When submitting a prior approval supplement, also provide a side-by-side -side comparison with the previously approved labeling, the RLD labeling, if applicable, and the proposed labeling. Electronic patient labeling, URLs. Do not replace the standard medication guide statement with a URL on container and carton labeling. A URL may be placed in addition to the standard statement provided that it meets the requirements of 21 CFR 610.60. Add a statement to the top of the medication guide to alert dispensers that a medication guide will need to be printed and dispensed. The medication guide dispensing statement should be included on all labeling pieces to include the container and carton labeling at the bottom of the prescribing information and at the top of the medication guide. Note the URL link should be simple, non-promotional, and not false or misleading. Ensure consistency of the URL link in all proposed labeling pieces. Patient information leaflets can also be supplied electronically and submitted as a CBE0. For DAS safety labeling changes, proposed labeling should include language identical to what is delineated in the SLC notification letter. Submit a side-by-side -side comparison of the previously approved labeling with the new SLC language. This concludes our presentation. In summary, we would like to reiterate that adherence to ANDA labeling best practices facilitates the labeling review process and enables the fulfillment of GDUFA 3 labeling commitments. This ultimately results in the approval of safe and effective generic drugs for the American public. We have several resources available to assist you, and we would like to thank you very much. We look forward to welcoming your questions in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm happy Thank to be you. here today to provide a new overview of major quality deficiencies and approaches available in GDUFA 3. Learning objectives. First, 
I will go over some of the most commonly seen major deficiency themes for pharmaceutical quality. Second, I'll discuss how the agency will communicate those deficiencies to ANDA applicants for their applications. And finally, I'll talk about how ANDA applicants can ask questions of the agency on ANDA major deficiencies, including some new approaches that may be available as part of our GDUFA 3 commitment. Some disclaimers. Please note the major deficiency themes I'll be discussing are not an exhaustive list of the quality major themes. A more thorough, though again not exhaustive, list can be found in Appendix A of the ANDA Amendments Guidance for Industry. Additionally, not all of the new approaches in GDUFA 3 that will be discussed are available for all ANDA drug products. First, major quality deficiency themes. When we look at drug substance, one of the most commonly seen major deficiencies is for the referenced drug master file, or DMF, for the active pharmaceutical ingredient, or API. While the agency will tell ANDA applicants their reference DMF has major issues, the specific issues will only be disclosed to the DMF holder. For more complex products, such as peptides, adequate demonstration of API sameness to the reference listed drug is key. Additionally, when toxicological studies are needed to qualify an unqualified impurity, this requires additional expertise outside of the quality assessment team, so this is considered a major deficiency. As we move into drug product, you can see just like the need for toxicological studies to evaluate an unqualified impurity for drug substance is considered a major deficiency, this can also be an issue for drug product. Major deficiencies around extractables and leachables could be due to a need for a safety assessment, an inadequate assessment, or a new unsolicited submission that includes extractable and leachable assessment. All of these would be considered major deficiencies. On unacceptable analytical methods, this may mean the proposed procedure is not stability indicating or is not discriminating enough to address product quality. Next, the major deficiency themes for manufacturing can encompass either facility or process deficiencies. The one we see the most is the major deficiency due to an inadequate facility, whether it's because of a pre-approval or surveillance inspection. For process, inadequate control of critical process parameters, inadequate justification of the scale-up strategy, or the need for new batches due to stability failures are commonly seen major deficiencies. When it comes to the major deficiencies for microbiology, adequate validation data is key. For example, product release or stability testing methods such as antibacterial endotoxin testing, sterility testing, or container closure integrity testing are important. Terminally sterilized products must provide adequate sterilization validation data. Aseptically filled products must show their manufacturing process supports the sterilization of the equipment and components used to produce the drug product. And for multi-dose products, they must provide evidence the product remains sterile dose to dose through their antimicrobial effectiveness testing. Finally, biopharmaceutics major deficiencies may be due to the need for new in vitro dissolution analytical methods because the proposed method is found inadequate. The data to support the proposed in vitro release acceptance criteria is inadequate. Or a new in vivo bioequivalent study is required to support the proposed post-approval change. Now for our first challenge question. 
FDA will tell an ANDA applicant why their referenced type 2 DMF is considered major. Is this A, true, or B, false? Please take a second to consider which answer is correct. And the correct answer is false. As noted earlier, an ANDA applicant will be informed their referenced DMF is major, but not the nature of the deficiencies sent to the DMF holder. It is up to the ANDA applicant to discuss with the DMF holder as needed to evaluate the impact on the referencing ANDA. For the next two sections of this presentation, I will only be addressing how the agency works with unapproved ANDA projects and will not address post-approval submissions. I will start with how major deficiencies will be communicated to applicants by the agency. First, information requests. Generally, Quality will not issue major information requests. There may be instances when we do, but it is unlikely to be a regular occurrence. Applicants may see major IRs from the clinical discipline for a combination product at the midpoint of the first review cycle, which could impact quality as well. If a major IR is issued from quality and there is no due date, that may indicate a forthcoming complete response letter. Next, discipline review letters or DRLs. Major quality deficiencies will be sent in the quality discipline review letter, though this will exclude facility deficiencies. Facility comments, such as notification that a PAI was conducted and may not have an acceptable outcome, or a travel restriction may be communicated in a DRL, but those are not considered deficiencies. If ANDA applicants respond to their major DRL by the due date, the goal date will be extended to allow time for review of the DRL response. Note that due date includes any agreed upon extension that is confirmed via email, and the goal date extension will be for a major amendment to allow time to review the response. Finally, complete response letters, or CRLs. Major quality deficiencies will be sent in CRLs, and this will include facility deficiencies. Any remaining deficiencies from consults that were not sent in a DRL will be communicated in this letter. An example would be if an applicant saw pending consult language in their DRL, the deficiencies from the consult as applicable will be provided in the CR letter. Please note, even if an ANDA received a minor DRL, it is still possible a major CR letter is sent, depending on the assessment of the DRL response and any remaining deficiencies that were not sent in the DRL, such as those related to an inadequate facility. Now for our next challenge question. Which letter type is when an applicant with an unapproved ANDA most likely will first learn of a major deficiency for microbiology? Will that be A, an information request letter, B, a discipline review letter, or C, a complete response letter? I'll give you a couple seconds to consider which answer is correct. The correct answer is B, discipline review letter. As I mentioned earlier, Quality generally will not be sending major IRs, so the first time an ANDA applicant may learn of a major microbiology deficiency would be in the mid-cycle DRL in their first review cycle. Now, I will talk about how applicants can engage with the agency on questions they have around major quality deficiencies. For meetings, there are two main types of questions clarifying, and scientific that may be asked by applicants. Clarifying questions may be asked in mid-cycle review meetings, or MCRMs, or in post-CRL teleconferences. Competitive generic therapy drug products and complex drug products are those potentially eligible for a mid-cycle review meeting. 
As you might have learned during yesterday's sessions, several new meeting types are now available to and applicants in GDUFA 3 to address scientific questions. This includes an enhanced mid-cycle review meeting or a post-CRL scientific meeting, which are both only eligible for complex drug products in general. ANDA applicants will be notified of their eligibility to have a mid-cycle review meeting or an enhanced mid-cycle review meeting, either in the filing acknowledgement letter or in the CGT granted letter, whichever comes later. Additionally, FDA may grant the post-CRL scientific meeting if it is for a complex generic product or, in FDA's judgment, the request raises issues that are best addressed via this meeting process and cannot be adequately addressed through controlled correspondences. Speaking of controlled correspondences, you might have learned in yesterday's session about new avenues in GDUFA 3 for ANDA applicants to ask questions of the agency regarding their post-CRL or post-TA applications via controls. Post-CRL questions for major deficiencies can be submitted via a controlled correspondence, and that control may be considered level one or level two, depending on the complexity of the major deficiency and the offices involved. Finally, our last challenge question. Which category of ANDA drug products are eligible for meetings to address scientific questions regarding major deficiencies? A, all drug products, B, CGT drug products, or C, complex drug products? Please take a second to consider which answer is correct. The correct answer is C, complex drug products. There may be rare cases where FDA will grant non-complex drug product a post-serial scientific meeting when the agency determines the issues raised cannot be adequately addressed by a controlled correspondence. So in summary, major deficiencies can span any of the quality subdisciplines and as is also noted in Appendix A of the ANDA Amendments Guidance for Industry, what's been discussed in this presentation is not an exhaustive list of major deficiency themes, and ANDA applicants will see others that are outside of those discussed today. Quality major deficiencies will most likely be communicated either in a DRL or CRL. In some instances, quality will communicate major deficiencies in an information request, but that will not happen with much frequency. And finally, ANDA applicants now have new avenues to address their questions regarding major deficiencies in GDUFA 3. I've provided the links to the ANDA Amendments Guidance for Industry as well as some of the updated guidance for industry based upon our GDUFA 3 changes. Additionally, I would like to highlight some other resources, including the GDUFA 3 commitment letter and the updated map regarding issuance of IRs and DRLs for unapproved ANDAs that include additional information related to this presentation. I'd like to thank Heidi Lee and Craig Keister, my supervisor and division director for their guidance as I've developed this presentation. And this concludes my presentation. I will address any questions you have in the upcoming Q&A panel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. As we receive more and more combination product applications, I would like to take the opportunity here to present some helpful tips on how to ensure that your submission will meet the drug port quality requirements, hopefully leading to your end approval in the first review cycle. For my talk, the learning objectives are to define drug lab combination product, describe the framework for quality assessment, discuss product development study to demonstrate suitability for use, discuss quality control and stability program. 
By definition, a combination product is a product composed of two or more different types of medical products, drug, device, and biological product per 21 CFR plus 3. Also, it is subject to CGMP requirements for combination products with the final guidance published in 2017. Generally speaking, combination product can include a single entity, code package, and cost labeled. Currently, there are three pathways for remarketing review of combination products. Device-led combination products, drug-led combination products, biologic-led combination products. For drug-led combination products, you can submit NDA or ANDA. The focus on my talk is ANDA. So how do we determine if it's a drug-led combination product? Well, the assignment is based on which constituent part provides the primary mode of action. PMOA is the single mode of action that provide the most important therapeutic action of the combination product. For drug-led combination product, drug is the most important therapeutic action. CEDA is the lead center, main point of contact that will have primary jurisdiction for, it, for its pre-market review and regulation. Based on this criteria, you should be able to determine whether you can submit an ender or not. Let me give you some examples of drug-led combination products. They can range from injectable, oral syringe, and cup, like the picture on the right-hand side that can measure dose, ophthalmic eyedropper, nasal spray, metered dose inhaler to transdermal delivery system and vaginal system. Today, I will discuss some key considerations for drug product quality when submitting an ender for perfused syringe and injector. First and foremost, let's look at the drug product quality framework we have already in place for combination products per ICH guidance. We started out with M4Q published in 2001, talking about reproducibility of the dose delivery. ICH-Q1A, Q6A, on functionality testing to the most recent ICH-Q12, which has an appendix dedicated to the combination product for post-approval CMC changes. Also, it's essential to apply the principles of ICH Q8, Q9, and Q10, dealing the drug product life cycle to assure drug product quality. Equally important for drug product quality framework, see FDA guidance on container closure system was published in 1999 talking about performance of assembled packaging system. Subsequently, more guidance was published to provide recommendations to industry on the CMC and quality requirements of combination products. So what happens when you submit an original enter to FDA? Basically, there are two main teams who will assess your submission. OPQ team will assess all quality aspects of an ender, whereas OGD team will assess bioequivalency, comparative threshold analysis for the user interface and labeling. Note that for labeling, drug product review team will assess description and how supply in the package insert so you will most likely see this type of labeling deficiency in the drug product quality DRL or CRL. 
since combination product can have a high risk profile, like complex device constituent part auto injector, and for emergency use, we will initiate a CDRH consult through ICCR process in placenta consult request. One for device engineering performance, evaluate essential performance requirement, drug delivery function, and so forth. The other consult for device quality system regulation. So you may receive deficiency from CDRH if the submission was found inadequate by CDRH. Let's go right into the section of your submission that are critical for device constituent part of the combination part. In P2, you should establish a quality target product profile, QTPP, to ensure desired drug product quality. The table on the right is an example of QTPP element for an auto injector ender. In addition, we will provide rationale for the selection or design of your CCS, including the device constituent part. And you can add that to the table. As a drug product quality tip, you can add device functional property requirement to the table as well to make your table complete. In P2 during drug product development, you need to identify critical quality attributes, CQAs, that should be within an appropriate limit. Use prior knowledge and risk assessment to identify material attributes and process parameters that can affect CQAs. You can also modify the CQA as more data is available. Finally, CQAs can include more product-specific aspects based on the route of administration for your combination product. To qualify your core, the CCS, you need to demonstrate suitability for its intended use, protection, compatibility, safety, and functionality. The last point is the key consideration for the combination product. For compatibility, a dosage form should not interact with the packaging components. Compatibility study can include glass denomination study per USP 1660 and in usability study per labeling. All contact materials should be considered. One compatibility example is that the API can react chemically with a compound leached out from the adhesive of a stick in needle perfused syringe, forming a new drug product impurity. Here's bring us to our next important topic. The packaging components should not leach undesirable amounts of drops of, of substance. In my last example, the compound leached out from the glue of the perfused syringe reacts with the API. Control of this impurity in the drop product spec may be needed. Therefore, we recommend you to conduct per USP 16631 and 1664. Assess per AET threshold. If your leachables are above AET threshold, identify and provide toxicological assessment. Common deficiencies are incorrect calculation of AET and omission of catheterization and tox assessment of leachables above AET. Here is another tip. Based on the cur our current FDA thinking, for injectable chronic use, you can use SCT of 1.5 microgram per day, and for non-chronic use, 
you can use 5 microgram per day. The last point that demonstrates the ability for use is performance and functionality. You should demonstrate that the device can deliver the product in an accurate and reproducible way, such as those. Test conditions to simulate the use of the drug product closely for labeling. Here we have a preview syringe. For performance, preview syringe can be tested for delivered volume accuracy, break loose force, glide force, for auto-injector with preview syringe or cartridge assembled into auto-injector, it can be tested for dose accuracy, cap removal force, activation force, extended needle length, and injection time. For a case study, a drug product is co-packaged with 14 syringes as 14-day kit with the label instruction to inject 0.2 mL daily for 14 days. To simulate the use of the drug product, the use of the drug product per labeling, you should provide accuracy study data of each dose from each of the 14 syringes for a total of 14 doses from one single vial. This data is essential to show your drug product can meet the labeled claim requirement. Moving along to P5 control of combo drug product, control strategies should ensure consistency of drug product quality. You want to develop, develop control strategy based on product width profile, such as complexity of design and manufacturing. For example, product and process control can be simplified as product complexity decreases. The specification for performance should be set based on the dosage form, route administration, and design feature. Moreover, the test method should follow the appropriate standard. For example, for auto-injector, the test method should comprise with the applicable ISO 11608 series, which are recognized by CDRH. I provide a link here. You can check to see which standards are recognized by FDA. In your drug product formulation spec, you want to include the quality attribute of the drug product per USP1 and test them at release and or stability as shown in this example here. In addition, we recommend you to include the device performance attribute of an auto-injector and test them as shown in the table here. As another tip, acceptance criteria along with a certification should be provided. Some common deficiencies are omission of description for integrity of device content constituent part, and device performance acceptance criteria in the drug product spec. That's all I have for P5. In P7, description of the container closure system should include enough information for quality assessment, such as material construction, coding treatment like floral tech and for plunger, Lubricants such as silicon oil for barrel and needle. Suitable QC specification and test procedure. Technical drawing. Certificates of analysis from both supplier and drug product manufacturer. USP compliance. And any other relevant technical information for the packaging components. This information is critical for core qualification of container closure system. We are at the last section, P8. To support expiry, you should package, store, and test your stability samples per ICH Q1A 
and Q1e. Here's another tip. For the stability program of a pen injector, as an example, one full primary batch should be completely filtered into cartridges, entirely assembled into pen injectors, and placed in cartons. The other two should provide sufficient fully assembled and packaged products for drug product quality and performance stability testing. For the last tip, you can use one position for post-approval stability testing if there's no worst case position. Here's the end of my talk. To see how much you understand the material, we have two challenge questions. Challenge question number one, which of the following product is not a truck lead combination product? A, truck in IV plastic containers. B, truck in bottles with child resistant closures. C, truck in glass vial with empty syringes. D, truck in aluminum tube with vaginal applicators. I will give you 15 seconds. The answer is B, drug in bottles with child resistant closure. Second challenge question, which of the following statement is not true? Auto injector must comply with CGMP requirements for combination products. CDRX assesses aging stability data and specification for essential performance requirement of auto-injector. Threshold of toxicological concern of 120 microgram per day can be used to calculate AET for assessing extractable and leachable of auto-injector due to treatment duration of less than one month. D, stability data should demonstrate that the performance of auto-injector is maintained during shelf life. I will give you 15 seconds. The answer is C. C is not true statement. In summary, I have covered the drug product quality considerations for generic combination products in terms of suitability for use, QC control, and stability requirements. With advancement in complexity of combination products for better patient care, we will continue to develop more guidance to address a regulatory submission. Stay tuned. Here, I want to acknowledge the following people from OLDP. Thank you for their support and guidance. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks so much for the great presentations. If you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. Looks like we have a few questions already coming in for Commander Neshua, and here is the first question. In the case of a discontinued RLD, if RLD labeling is available on drugs at FDA, is it recommended to show a comparison against RLD labeling in the original ANDA submission? Thank you for that question. 
if the RLD labeling is available on drugs at FDA, even if it is discontinued, we recommend showing the labeling comparison against the RLD labeling in the original ANDA submission. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have a, another question from Commander Nishiwa. And here is the question. What differences in labeling can be accepted between the RLD versus the AND application? Thank you for that question. Um, permissible differences can include differences approved under a suitability petition. Um, other differences because the drug product and the reference listed drug are produced or distributed by different manufacturers. And so this would include um, due to omission of an indication or other aspect of labeling protected by patent or SOCD. So those are some of the permissible differences. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We've got a few questions that came in for Kimmy Odesino. And here's the first question. Can the ANDA applicant have additional information in labeling with justification? Thank you for that excellent question. So generally speaking, ANDA labeling should be the same as the reference listed drug. However, for supplements, the regulatory pathway for providing additional information with justification would be a prior approval supplement. And during the review process, we will determine the acceptability of that additional information. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question that came in for uh, <clears throat> Kimmy Odesina. And here is the question. Is it a best practice to denote a space for a lot number and expiration date in the draft container labels in the original ANDA? Thank you once again for that question. And absolutely, yes, that would be considered a best practice to denote a space for a lot number and expiration date in the draft container labels. Thank you. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a couple of questions that came in for Karen Ireland. And here is the first question. In regard to peptides, is the sameness in terms of structural conformation or mass or sequence? Thank you for that question. Um, all of those can be factors when it comes to peptide sameness. I would refer you to the draft guidance that was published in November 2022 for additional information. Uh, that guidance is sameness evaluations in an ANDA active ingredients. Uh, if you find that after you read that and work on developing your product, you still have questions for the agency, for your complex product, I would recommend you look at our final guidance uh, published in October 22 uh, for formal meetings between FDA and ANDA applicants of complex products under GDUFA uh, to see if you qualify for one of those meeting types uh, to answer your additional questions. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question that came in from Karen Ireland. And here's the question. And they're regretting that it's not clear to, to the questioner, but what is the difference between a CRL and a DRL? Also, if there is no response time specified in the agency's notification letter, what are the general deadline expectations? Thank you for the question. Uh, so a CRL or complete response letter uh, it would contain all the deficiencies uh, across multiple disciplines, so labeling, bioequivalence, or quality, uh, and closes out your review cycle. A DRL or discipline review letter uh, would be individual to a discipline. For example, you might get a quality DRL or a bioequivalence DRL. Um, 
If there is no response time specified in the letter, for example, a DRL with no due date, that might indicate that you are getting an upcoming CRL. Um, and we would ask that you either wait for the CRL and respond once you are able to respond to the full complete response letter, or you uh, respond to the DRL as soon as you're able to fully respond to all deficiencies included. The general response time expected for a CRL is within one year of issuance of that CRL. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We have a few questions that came in for Dr. Kai Kwok, and here's the first question for Kai Kwok. Where can sponsors find FDA guidance on EPRs? Hello, everyone. Um, for EPR, currently, um, we don't have a guidance out there for you to take a look. Um, it's under development. In the future, we may have guidance or may not have a guidance coming out for EPR. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question for Kai Kwok. And here's the question. Can the other SCT be used apart from what was mentioned in your presentation by following ICHM7? Thank you for the question. Um, currently, we do not accept the TTC from ICHM7 based on the duration of treatment to calculate your AET. So we have to use SCT, as I mentioned earlier, to calculate your AET, AET for legible and extractable assessment. Thank you. Thank you for responding to those questions. Moving up to the beginning of our panel, we have a couple more questions that came in for Commander Aneshua. And here is the first question. When should we include drug product established name, including the dosage form and the labeling? And is it mandatory to add the USP designation to the drug substance and drug product established name? Thank you for that question. Um, so when we mentioned the drug product and established name, this would include the dosage form. So if the RLD labeling is referring to the drug product, the established name with the dosage form should be used in the ANDA labeling. Whereas if the RLD labeling is referring to the drug substance, the drug substance without the dosage form would be used in the ANDA labeling. And with regards to the USP designation or descriptor in labeling, use of the USP designation is not mandatory. Uh, when the USP descriptor is used, we recommend uh, limiting the use of the USP descriptor uh, to the dosage forms and strengths, the description, and the house applied sections of the prescribing information. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Commander Nashua, and here's the question. What if the cap over seal needs to be texted with a cautionary statement, same as the RLD, but in case, if it's kept blank, will it be considered a change in labeling? Thank you for that question. If the RLD has a cautionary statement on the cap over seal and the ANDA's cap over seal is kept blank, this would lead to a labeling deficiency as the ANDA should be the same as the RLD and have that cautionary statement on the cap over seal. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a few more questions that came in for Kimmy Odesina. And here is the first question. What type of supplement should be submitted for addition of a QR code and electronic medication guide and URL statements? Thank you, that is a great question. So these types of um, additions should be submitted as a CBE zero. Thank you. 
Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Kimi Odesina, and here is the question. What is the process for incorporating a new proprietary name and labeling? Thank you again. That is an excellent question. Uh, so a new pro uh, proposed proprietary name should be submitted as a prior approval supplement. Um, please note that these uh, new names need to be submitted and approved by the Division of Medication Error Prevention and Analysis, also known as DMEPA, before it can be approved for use in labeling. Thank you. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a couple more questions that came in for Karen Ireland. And here is the first question. Can a product directly get CRL, get a CRL without any IR, DRL during review cycle? Thank you for the question. Uh, it depends on which review cycle we are in. For the first review cycle of an ANDA, generally an applicant will receive uh, at least one DRL during uh, around the midpoint of the review cycle. However, once uh, we are in subsequent review cycles after, for example, a CR, uh, those reviews may happen without any IR or DRL being sent out. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one more question for Karen Ireland, and here's the question. In what instances might quality send a major IR? Thank you for that question. If the assessment team determines early on in a major amendment or an original and a review cycle that there is information missing that they would be considered major, we may send a major IR at that time. Um, additionally, uh, we do look at the prioritization for that drug product, such as if it's for a declared public health emergency um, to try and get that uh, major IR sent to get to approval uh, as promptly as possible. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We're moving on to our next panelist. We've got about 13 minutes left. We do have a couple questions just came in for Kai Kwok, and here is the first question. Is the food grade certification mandated for all drug device combination products? That's a good question. Uh, basically, for combination product, for your non-combination product, your requirement to qualify your CCS is almost the same. Um, so what we're looking for if it's the syringe um, on your barrel or stopper will be combined with USP. So that is come before the foot grade certification. We probably would not need those because if it's combined with USP. But for other stuff, maybe non-USP, we don't have USP chapter um, to assure quality, then we may look for foot grade certification. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions for Kai Kwok, and here is the next question. Can both drug formulation specification and device performance specification be on the same specification sheet in P5? Another good question. Uh, yes, you can have it separate or be put in the same specification for your drug pattern. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one more question for Kai Kwok. And here's the question. Can you please confirm that the SCT given on slide 15 is applicable for a parenteral drug? Yes, um, so yes, the slide the 15, the chronic duration of use, uh, you use SCT of 1.5 microgram per day and less than chronic use will be 5 microgram per day. You can use that for parental, parental drug product. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving up to the beginning of our panel, 
we do have a few more questions that came in for Commander Neshua. And here's the next question. When should USP be used with the drug product name in the prescribing information? Thank you for that question. Um, if the drug product, if your drug product is subject to a USP monograph, um, we recommend only using USP with the drug product name in the dosage forms and strengths description and how supplied sections of the prescribing information. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question for Commander Nishiwa. And here's the question. If we already certified, already certified to a patent with use codes and a new use code is listed for that patent, do we need to submit anything for the new use code listed? Thanks for that question. Um, so yes, you would need to address all new information and this would include um, any new use codes listed in the orange book for the reference listed drug. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question that just came in for Karen Ireland. And here is the question. If I received and responded to a minor DRL, why did I just receive a major CRL? Thank you for the question. So applicants might receive a major CRL after they've gotten a minor DRL for uh, several reasons. It could be that the information they submitted in their DRL resulted in new major deficiencies. Uh, there is also the possibility that there was a pending consult at the time of the minor DRL and the consult was finalized with major deficiencies, which would result in a major CR. Finally, uh, it, the CRL could include major facility deficiencies uh, that we do not include in our quality DRL, and any of those instances could result in a major CR after the applicant received a minor DRL. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question that just came in from Carolyn Ireland, and here is the question. Is it mandatory to issue a DRL during mid-cycle review? Thank you for the question. Um, the agency, uh, per the GDUFA 3 commitment letter, has noted that they will, we will send um, for each discipline either an IR or DRL at or around the mid-cycle of the first review cycle. Um, so generally, uh, yes, we will be sending those around the mid-cycle for the first review cycle. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We've got a few more questions that came in for Kai Kwok. And here is the first question. For a combination product kit containing a lyophilized powder vial, a diluent vial, syringes, and needles, how many batches of diluent are required for stability testing? Um, good question. Uh, basically, if you manufacture both a lyophilized powder vial and a diluent vial, you will need to provide stability data from at least three exhibit batches, including both the lyophilized powder and diluent vial per ICHQ1A, even the diluent is a sterile water for injection. And also a drop product supplied with a reconstitution diluent should include a separate section 3.2.P with the diluent information. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question for Kai Kwok. And here's the question. What are some of the pump performance functionality data that should be provided in a submission for a multiple dose metered dose pump dispenser for topical use? Thank you for the question. Uh, it will depend on the design of your metered dose pump dispenser and labeling. And some of the performance tests 
such as number of palm to prime, dose uniformity, mean dose weight, meaning the dispensing amount per actuation, total number of doses, actuation force should be considered to, dis to demonstrate suitability of use for your proposed uh, combination product CCS. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We're checking our Q and it looks like we've worked through all the questions at this time that are relevant to the presentations that were provided. We're going to give a huge thank you to our presenters and panelists for the great presentations and for answering numerous questions that came in. We'll now enter into our lunch break until 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Please enjoy your lunch. <laughs>